Arunang karuna tarangitakshi Drita pasang kusha pushpa bana chapam Anima di biravritam mayukai Raham mityeva vibhava ye bhava Mahapashupatastragni Nirdagdasura Sainika Namaste and welcome to another ecstatic episode of Lalita Sahasranama. <laughs> so this time we're continuing the story of her defeat of Bandasura. And of course, Bandasura's story has uh, several levels of meaning. Like all these mantras, like all these namas in Lalita Sahasranam. So the external meaning is that she burnt the city of Bandasura with an, a, a special weapon that created so much fire that annihilated the whole enemy army and everything. So that's the external meaning. Now what is the use of having external and internal meanings? The use is that ignorant people are captivated by the external meaning. A big war, I mean what could be more dramatic than that, right? People love stories about fighting. <laughs> this is the human disease, isn't it? People love to fight. They'll fight over any kind of nonsense. <laughs> so they like to imagine that their gods are like that too. Actually, she has no need to fight. She could just make Bandasra disappear just like that. But she creates the external drama just to drive home a lesson that will be remembered because people love drama. Huh? Now, of course, <laughs> once one advances a little bit in consciousness, he realizes all this drama is very distracting. It brings one to attend to the senses and the external world. Whereas real advancement in knowledge means attending to the internal world. And so, there are also internal interpretations of the same mantra, the same nama. Huh? And of course, the meaning here is that Bandasura, who signifies ignorance, foolishness, ego, attachment, lust, and all that, is defeated by her Pashupati Astra. The Pashupati Astra is the mantra, Aung Nama Shivaya. Aung Nama Shivaya. Here in South India, anytime you see a sadhu, especially if they're wearing the Tripundra, you just say Aung Nama Shivaya, Aung Nama Shivaya. They love that. Huh? Because this is the Pashupatyastra. This is the mantra that destroys ignorance, destroys foolishness, destroys ego. Now, one can uh, take either the path of worshipping Shiva or worshipping Shakti. In the end, it doesn't matter. But it's a matter of taste. See, on the level of Karma Yoga and Bhakti Yoga, these are still external activities. So, of course, they're going to be subject to our mind, our vasanas, huh? our past mental activities, our tastes, and so on. So, in this way, the Vedas provide different, different tastes, different flavors of worship, so that everyone can be satisfied. Everyone can have the 
type of deity that pleases them. Now, personally to me, the Shakti worship, huh? the Shakta path, or the Kaula path, the Tantric path, is very attractive. It fits my personality, my tastes. But others may find some difference. That's no matter. The principles are always the same. No matter what the taste, the mood, the rasa, or the deity being worshipped. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. The, the, the principles are the same. That one moves from the external types of worship to the internal types of worship. One moves from karma yoga, or, which are material pious activities, then to bhakti yoga, which is spiritual love, and then to raja yoga, which is meditation, and finally jnana yoga, which is the realization of us. So let me read a little more. Now, the Pashupata is described in the Linga Purana as a, a rite, uh, R-I-T-E, a rite, which means a ritual that destroys all material attachment. So this is what we want. Huh? So this Pashupati mantra, Pashupatyastra, is a weapon that destroys all these negative things that we don't want. Ego, attachment, ignorance, foolishness. Huh? What does foolishness mean? It means doing stupid things. <laughs> See, in this world, everything that we do has a reaction. Every cause has an effect. So the actions that produce Foolishness are in the mode of ignorance, tamoguna. Tamoguna and rajaguna. Rajaguna means passion. Tamoguna means ignorance. So when we perform activities in these modes, then the karma they generate is not so nice. One has to be born in the material world, take a material body, go through all the sufferings of birth and childhood and work and so many things just to maintain this body. And what is this body? Suffering. Huh? <laughs> this body, this mind, they are impermanent, unsatisfactory, and not self. Just like the whole world of the other, the whole external world is like this. See, so this is bandha. This is foolishness. To be attached to these things, to relish, to value these external things, these are the causes of suffering. So one has to remove one's attention from the external world and direct it into the internal world. Now, exactly how that is done is a detail. It doesn't really matter, as I said, which deity you worship, or what mantra you choose. But you must worship some deity, you must choose some mantra, and then concentrate the mind on that mantra. Because we talked in, a, in another series about the mysteries of the matrika, the four levels of speech. So speech begins in the muladhara chakra, as an impulse of energy. And then as it rises through the chakras, it becomes more particularized until when it reaches the heart chakra, it is very much defined in terms of the object and the content. And then when it reaches the throat chakra, it comes out as speech. So this uh, manifestation of vach, or speech uh, is gross when it comes out through the mouth, but before it reaches that stage, it's more subtle. Therefore, one meditates on the mantra within the heart, chanting it silently. And this is the advice of all scriptures, all traditions, 
Huh? Except the, the fanatical sectarians who think that you should chant the mantra externally. Well, that, that might be okay in the beginning. But to really reach the perfection of mantra, one has to bring it within. One has to become subtle. Uh, the subtle chanting in the heart is the stage just before <laughs> the manifestation of the word in speech. So by doing this, one brings the attention from the external to the internal. And this is yoga. Uh, this is how one enters the path, enters the stream that flows to the ocean, which is compared to Brahman. So this Om Namah Shivaya is one of the principal mantras of Shiva. Aum, of course, consists of three transcendental letters. A, which means creation. U, which means sustenance. And M, which means destruction. And then the Bindu. A, O, M, and Bindu. The moment of silence. Each of the vowels, A, U, and M, are long. That means that each one is held for two beats, two padas, as they're called in Sanskrit. And then the bindu is held for half a pada. This is all described in the Mundaka Upanishad, right near the end. Huh? I'm not making this up. You know, people, people like to chant Om. But Om is really a different mantra than Aum, with the half a beat of silence afterwards. And it has a different meaning. Because not only does it mean creation, maintenance, and destruction, with the interval, the, the uh, transcendental interval in between the creations, huh? it also means the three states of consciousness waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. And in this case, the Bindu represents Turiya. Turiya is the root of the other three states of consciousness. And then even Turiya is transcended when one comes to the, the real Bindu, huh? <laughs> the source of everything, and it becomes Turiya Tita, Turiyatita is the ultimate, <laughs> confirmed, the ultimate realization of I am that, tattvamasi, uh, the complete non-duality. And this is known only to the sages. So to become a sage is to reach this ultimate stage of self-realization which is also ultimate happiness and satisfaction. Because just like this material world, material body, material mind are uh, temporary, unsatisfactory, and not self, Bindu is actually the opposite. <laughs> it's it's uh, eternal, very satisfying, uh, and it is the self, sat, chit, ananda, eternal existence, eternal consciousness, eternal bliss. But Bindu is actually not exactly consciousness, but it's the pure awareness behind consciousness. Well, what's the difference? Pure awareness is aware only of itself. So this might sound very strange. How can pure awareness be aware of itself and not have an object? Well, it's very simple. Because in Bindu, <laughs> there is no subject. There is no I. There is only all-pervading self. And this self, with a capital S, is the real self, the real being. Uh, that is everything, that is the source, and that is the ultimate aim of self-realization. 
Aung Tat Sat. Aung Shakti Aung.